Hey guys, if you can think about how you found this podcast, maybe it's on Instagram or TikTok, maybe someone shared it with you. I don't run ads for the show or have sponsorships, so the only way this grows is through word of mouth. If this was valuable for you in any way, my only ask is if you could share this with someone who you think would help their investing journey or business. Thanks a lot, and let's get to the episode. Welcome back to STR Like the Best. I'm your host, Michael Chang. It's my pleasure to welcome Max Ulmer to the show. Max, thank you for spending some time with us today. Of course. Thanks for having me. So before we start off, can you please just introduce yourself to the audience to so know what's your background? Of course. So I'm actually 25 years old. As you guys can hear my accent, I was born in Germany, born and raised. I've been in the United States for like six years now. Initially came here as a professional track and field athlete and then transitioned into real estate. Currently based in Tampa, Florida. And this is where most of our you know local real estate and our real estate projects are based and we do pretty much everything from fix and flips to multifamily construction and also syndications for stabilized valued apartments and obviously own rentals long-term and short-term. Perfect. Perfect. Well, before we got on the show, you were telling me about your ground up construction and your, your eight short-term rentals. So uh, we're definitely going to hit on that on the show, but before we start kind of my typical op- opening question. Was there a memorable short-term rental guest experience that you, you want to share with us? Something that kind of comes, that comes to mind? I honestly do not have funny stories. My wife is usually the one who handles like all of the customer, you know, relationships and engagement. I usually handle them the ones that go too far. I would say <laughs> I have a couple of these stories. I don't know if that is how you want to start that podcast. Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. <laughs> so like the worst one that we, we had for sure by far was somebody booked our Airbnb and he actually never stayed there. And we have obviously clear rules. He cannot have dogs in there, no parties, nothing like that. And so he came in, I mean, it was a duplex that we converted. So there was one already staying there and then they were supposed to rent the A unit. So the person in unit B reached out and he's like, I thought dogs are not allowed, but like all night long, I have this dog like scratching on my door, sniffing underneath the door. And I was like, no, there's no dogs, right? Because the guy didn't mention dogs. So of course we checked the security cameras, realized there's two huge pit bulls in his whole family in this Airbnb. And it was not even the person who actually booked it. And so we went out there, we talked to them. It was a totally different person than we initially, you know, had a conversation with. Turns out that there was a tenant of the person that was reaching out to us and they had like black mold or something in their property. So they currently got them in Airbnb and those tenants absolutely destroyed the unit. They've been there for three days for the police involved to get them out. The dogs scratched all the walls. They had babies. There was open diapers everywhere. The dogs, you know, pee and pooped on the couch. Oh my God. I mean, it was like in three days, there was a full rehab and it was like, (laughs) I was like, Oh my gosh, how can you, like, how can you, just be so disrespectful to somebody's property. And yeah, that was the worst one. After that one, I was like, okay. <laughs> so how did you fix it? So like, so look, I mean, these things happen, right? And, you know, I think it's important for people to know that, you know, there's a good and bad part of this. So let's t- I'm talk about this situation. Did you, were you able to go on air cover and, you know, get them to pay for the damages or did you have to come out of pocket? Yes, you live and learn, learn the lessons. So we had to come out of pocket. We obviously tried to deal with Airbnb and, and took pictures. Now, what the the how, or the the tenant, if you would say, so was pretty smart. He knew it was in big trouble. So what he actually did, he reached out to Airbnb complaining about us before, and said we were basically, you know, violating the rules and scaring him and all that stuff. Even though he was never even there. And so Airbnb was like already red flagged and then you know, we contacted afterwards and then it was like his word against ours. And we like, this guy never was there. We filed a police report, like he had the pictures and it was just back and forth and Airbnb eventually didn't do anything. It didn't help. So we had to go out of pocket. And then afterwards we learned that he can sign up for insurance and we didn't have that in place. We kind of assumed that it's all covered through Airbnb, but he was smart enough, I guess, to start it before we did. So he was like in the right. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, that sucks. I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah, like I mean, I think there's the the lesson, um, at least you know when we deal with similar situations like this, is we would have just kicked them out. Like I would have, you know, you know, I know I know it was early in your journey, but if we ever had that kind of situation, we, we never really had that bad. But when we have people that aren't aren't part of the reservation, we're almost always kicked them out, unless you know it's 
especially they had dogs and stuff like that. Like that yeah. just sounds like a bad situation. But anyway, it's like, I mean, you're right. We live and learn and, you know, <laughs> now you've skilled up, you know, a really, really nice portfolio in, in Tampa. So tell us a little bit about, tell us about what you're doing, right? I think there are two parts of it. You had a portfolio of long-term rentals and then you converted to short-term rentals. How many STRs do you have now? Eight. Eight. Okay. Are they, where are they mostly located? Usually like between downtown and the beach side. So St. Pete, Clearwater, obviously like that's a, almost like an eyelet strip between the Bay of Tampa. So you're always like 10 minutes to the water, 10 minutes to the beach. So we're picking okay. these locations that are like in between. Everyone wants to go to Clearwater Beach and St. Pete Beach, but also wants to be close to the hospital or close to restaurants. So we're picking those locations. Got it. And then tell us, just tell us a little bit about how you constructed this portfolio. So we initially started as wholesalers a while back because when we started real estate, we had no money, no network, no experience. We kind of got started to make money. We had no money when COVID initially started because back then we were still living in Oregon. Got it. In so Oregon. Actually, let's pause it for one moment. So who's we? Is it you and your wife? or Yes, me, me and my wife, Caitlin. It's always yeah. us. We started <laughs> it together. We're still doing it together. But, you know, long story short, obviously we lived in Oregon due to my sports background. I was you know, competing for Nike and and COVID hit Nike, sorry, Oregon was shutting down like crazy. There was absolutely nothing. You couldn't do nothing. You couldn't make any money. So we, you got hit pretty hard and eventually transitioned into real estate. But out of wholesaling, we transitioned into flipping because we understood how to find deals and had a flipping business because we were still short of money. We still had to you know, deal with hard money lenders to get obviously our resume. We did a lot of turnkey because we had a lot of connections to investors overseas and the yield was making sense. So we raised a bunch of money. We started doing turnkey projects for investors overseas. So we found it, renovated it, put a tenant in, managed it. So we did 53 so sorry, turnkey so transactions. Let's, let's pause it. Sorry. And just because you know, I just want to level set everyone, you know, so first of all, what is wholesaling? Just very like 30 seconds. What's wholesaling? Right. So wholesaling is basically you're taking a property on a contract and you're flipping the contract without actually touching the property. You're just selling it to an investor and you're arbitraging on the contract price. Uh, so, easy way there, to so, so, so there it's, you know, you buy for a hundred thousand, you're going to, sorry, you're getting a contract for hundred K you find another investor because you've done the work to find the property, negotiate the deal. And you find another investor to say, Hey, let's buy this property for 150,000. And then you make right. $50,000. Is that, is that accurate? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You, obviously you're usually selling it to flippers, right? So you're looking for value at distressed properties and you have to get it at a discount where it makes sense for the flippers still to come in and make money. And that's how we started. And obviously by having access to deals and getting deals at such discounts, we quickly realized if we also doing a flip, we can get both sides of the transaction. <laughs> we transition into, you know, having both sides of the business and acquisition department for the wholesale kinds of transactions and then the flipping division. And like I said, because of our age and how we got started, we utilized other people's money to do them until we had a resume to do hard money. So we then transitioned into turnkey, which basically means you're doing it all for somebody. You're finding a deal, you're renovating the property, you're finding a tenant, you're managing the tenant, and then you're helping somebody refinance. And they're basically buying it to have a cash flowing passive property for you to work. So you get management fees on a monthly basis percentage, but you also get upfront a fee for finding it and for renovating it and a project management fee. So you're kind of almost doing the same thing than just selling a flip, but you're continuously having some ownership in those deals in the long run. So it kind of helps you build that portfolio. And out of those rentals that we've acquired through our turnkey partnerships, we so, obviously so, so all can I pause you there for a moment. So yeah. let's let's talk about because I, I think it's you know for folks that aren't as experienced as you I think people get, are always interested in the kind of the value chain, right? So for these turnkey investments, so you raise money for, so you're from Germany, you raise money from, you know, probably your, your network, your, your, you and your wife's network from home, they are investing in, in Florida. And then, so when you say that you are doing this turnkey, so are you charging them a fee? So you're charging them a fee to find a property for you and then kind of manage the entire renovation, right? So kind of what does that look like? Is it like a percentage fee? Is it a flat fee? How do you, how does someone like you make money from that? And then what's the benefit to the investor, which right. you know, pretty apparent, but you know, we just talk about that. Obviously like the, the way the benefit, you know, for you as the operator is one, you don't have to look for and buy it, right? You're basically doing a flip knowing hundred percent somebody's going to buy it. 
how you underwrite those is always in the investor's perspective. If I would buy it, what is my cash on cash return? It's always based on yield, right? If they're putting 40 grand down to get into this property and the rest is backed by, by an equity, how much cash flow is generated on a monthly basis? What's my yield? And does it make sense? So we're usually targeting an eight to 10% cash on cash return around two to $300 a month in cash flow. So as long as you have those numbers in place, you can do your math backwards and see how much can you charge to get the invested in amount and obviously you know where you have to buy it and how much profit you can make in between. So you're squeezing whatever's left to provide an opportunity to investor, but you having a secure transaction. So along the way, you know, you're doing it for somebody, you're not being exposed to the market. So it reduces your risk. And it also how we handle it. Usually we took, cause I guess in our situation, we had international people doing the fundraising or bringing the funds over. So most of these people couldn't qualify for loans. So yeah. A lot of the time we guaranteed the loan, therefore we took an ownership percentage in these deals. You know, I guess the traditional way is different where you just sell it and you're just doing the management. So we had an ownership percentage plus the management. That's great. And it's kind of how we got started. Yeah. That's really smart. So I'm curious, like what, what type of ownership percentages do you usually keep in these deals? It really depends on, you know, what kind of deal it is and what's the equity. We have had great deals in the past. You know, it always depends also on the goal of whoever is investing with you and in the expertise. We had deals in the past where it was even a 50, 50 split. Oh, um, wow. Great. Um, just, just to guarantee the debt 50. Wow. That's great. Right. Fantastic. Right. But as long, as long as he can still maintain, and that was obviously before interest rates went through the roof, right? So you could still provide an 8% yield and 300, 250, $300 of cash flow. And it made sense for you guarantee the remaining 50%. So we never really lacked on still providing what we promised. But if there was more, we came in and said, hey, we can guarantee the loan. You know, we got 3% loans back then. Now that's yeah. not the case. So it's a lot different these days. But when the rates were good and we bought stuff extremely discounted, we had a lot of market appreciation and we got in and out quick when the market was upswinging in Florida, we had opportunities where it just made sense for both of us to kind of benefit on it together. But the majority of time, you may be taking like a 15%-ish ownership if you're lucky and, and it still adds up if you're doing a couple of those. Oh yeah. Yeah, for sure. Especially, you know, it, you're not, there's no money in and you're, you know, taking, that, that's great. So congrats on that. And right. thank you for sharing that. Folks are always interested on how these right. things work and then, you know, lifting, lifting the curtain. So I appreciate that. So why don't we, let's move on to more of the short-term rental side. So how, so did you, your STR portfolio, were they conversions for long-term from the long-term rentals? Right. So what I was getting with that story is those those long term rental turnkey deals that we managed and we had part of ownership eventually came due that, you know, tenants were moving and then we had to replace them. So eventually we realized that obviously we're living in Tampa, Florida, which is a great market for short term. Let's go in and versus trying to find a new tenant is test out if it makes sense as an Airbnb. So we started with one and eventually scaled. So we transitioned basically those long term rentals into short term rentals and there's pros and cons with it, right? Obviously the pro is that you already know it's cash flowing as a long term. So whatever happens, you're just going back to it. But obviously you never really came in with the intention of doing a short term in the first place. So the layout of the home is probably not the way you would do it if you would do a renovation for an STR, right? So the kitchens were sometimes outgrade, out, outdated. Mm -hmm. Landscaping wasn't really, you know, our prim primary focus for tenants. So it was like a, a lower end quality of, of short term rentals to start with. And obviously we matched our price point to compete because we knew that it is not the vibe and the experience to book it. But those ones initially that we converted were close to the hospital. Okay. So we realized a lot of people might travel there because of people in the hospital, travel nursing and so on. So it was okay. There was not as much demand for this wow shiny vibes kind of environment but we quickly realized once we kind of get started that our competitors are beating us in the off season because their design is just different people book it because it's a vibe you take pictures for instagram ours is like a must nothing else is available you're the cheapest okay. <laughs> with you. and then you know the, you know second and third one then we kind of went more and more and more into it, but we didn't go in and renovated it, totally painted it, did some landscaping. So we did more and more to each unit to just kind of separate us and test out and based on the location. But we definitely learned a lot that Airbnb is not just the numbers you see on comms, it's really just 
how can you separate yourself? Like what yeah. is the theme you can create that separates you from going to a hotel in the first place or going with anyone else? What is the value you bring to a customer? And obviously then your customer relationship along the way to get, you know, reviews and good stars and all that. So it's definitely something we've learned. We didn't expect at the beginning. We thought it's just easy going, put it in Airbnb and somebody's going to book it <laughs> and you're all going to make double the money, but not really, not quite as easy, huh? So it's, it's not, it's not, and I think it, it's definitely evolved, but let's, I want to unpack this a little bit. So when you first started, kind of what was the spread? Because there are a lot of people actually that own long-term rentals that are interested in converting to short-term rentals. So I think that, and I think this is something I want to double click on. So first on the economic side, right? Like how much more were you making, you know, first one or two where you didn't really do, sound like you didn't do that much. It's just alternate came out, maybe some paint, some furniture, and then that was it. How much more were you, if you're, say you're making like $300 a month, LTR, what was STR like on average? Good question. Obviously, those ones are, I need to mention that we bought those. The Tampa market have been crazy since 2020, Florida in general. It's just like 38% appreciation year over year. So we bought some of them in 2020, discounted back then, renovated them. So there was massive equity. So eventually... Obviously, the rental rates went still up, so we had a pretty pretty good mortgage, low interest payments. So our actual monthly out of pocket was was fairly low. So we already made like four five hundred dollars a month on just like the regular rentals, and mm -hmm. we had tenants in there since twenty twenty. Which, if we would have just gotten a new tenant, and we probably could have made closer to eight eight fifty for rental okay. rates. So let's say um, eight, let's say eight hundred. Let's say eight hundred was like the you, you could have got eight hundred. What well, what was the STR like cash flow from that? STR was probably like the net cash after all expenses, I would say between 3,500 and four grand during, during the season in those slower months, you're making, you know, maybe like a thousand, two grand, depending on your, you know, average. I mean, or you're still, rate. So you're still, I mean, two, I mean, so what is that like two to four X? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's okay. So just for folks, you know, that are listening to this, that's the power of the short term rentals. Look, there, there's definitely cons to that, right? You know, the story in the beginning about the, the guy, the dogs, you know, it's definitely more work. You have to put more money into it. But, you know, that is the opportunity, right? You can double to 4x your cash flow without doing a ton of renovations, a, a ton of, you know, wow factor into your property. Now, let's transition a little bit. Now, you know, on the eighth property, for example, that you've kind of gone through you know, the first six, seven and learn what extras, what wow factors did you put into your LTRs to make it more, or, you know, if you did to make them more appealing so that you can compete with, you know, the, the, you know, so that yours isn't a must. Yours is a, I'd like no. to stay there. Yeah. So the last three, actually, we went in and completely rehabbed it again. Okay. Okay. So Wait, like, so like, ter like actually tearing down walls and like what kind yeah. of rehab? Yeah. So, so one of them, yeah, we actually converted it into a, a duplex. So like we actually added walls. So we, we almost, um, one of them, we did a full gut because like oh. the layout was beneficial for us to add more rooms, meaning more beds, because there was just this oddly big room that could have easily been divided in two. And then the other ones, we just kind of came in, obviously new kitchen, new bathrooms, new showers, all that totally painted the outside, you know, made it a vibe, but uh, the property yeah. itself was not just white we became actually animated like you know this is like florida blue with the yellow roof like it was just pop and oh, it was cool. like what people would like now yeah. i would have never done this for a tenant right <laughs> they don't care and then we obviously did the landscape and we put all these shells around the property so it was matching you know if somebody goes to florida it's kind of what they look for like a beachy property so we definitely spent a lot of money in the renovation, which it was in rental ready conditions, but came in, did it because we knew we've learned from the previous five that if we do the extras, you're going to get rewarded in the long run. And it was in a great location. So it made sense for us that this is going to be something if we put the money in, in the long run, we're definitely going to benefit from that. Got it. So maybe if you could provide some numbers. So the house, let's, let's, let's pick the, pick the one that you want to talk about, like, how much is that house right now? If you were to, you know, if you were to put it on a market, like how much would that house, like house number eight or the one where you divide it, actually, I, I thought it was kind of cool. The one where you divided, you know, an, the, the big room and then you 
put in some walls to, to get a little more, more structure. How much would the house be right now? If you were to sell it? Yeah. So it was an Walmart. interesting, it was, it was a two story. So it was a duplex. Initially, we made it to a triplex oh, based okay. on location. It was walking distance to the hospital right downtown, 10 minutes from the beach. It was a great spot. I would probably say right now, you know, we could sell it for, for 750 as is based on locations and based on like basically a triplex from traditional cash flow. We bought it back in, in 2020 for, for 450, had it as a duplex that was rented. Fantastic. And we Fantastic. probably came in, spend another 120 grand to make oh, it. Oh, wow. You did. Okay. Okay. All right. So there was a lot of, I mean, going in, we completely did everything new outside. I mean, it looks totally different. Landscaping was pretty significant, putting palm trees in that were not existing before. So we probably still all out. I mean, we've, we've obviously gotten some return over those two years, but if you just yeah. say 450, 120, there's still equity as of right now. Now, if you're selling it based on the cash flow, it will generate as an Airbnb, it will probably be way, way more, right? Because yeah. now you can really get, get a great return. We have travel nurses utilizing that space based on the closeness on, onto the beach, sorry, onto the hospital. And the way we set up the, the lower unit is actually there was just still like a door in between. So if we have a big family, a big group, we just opened it up. So it's a double. So we, we kind of thought about, okay, how can we make it the best possible? So we had groups that booked it and they asked if there's an you know, additional room or whatever. And we're like, yeah, we can actually have the whole other unit. And then we just book it all together. Yeah. All travel nurses are more on the side, but it's just one, one place, one, one side, and then just always working. So we get a little bit of the tourism people that utilize, have people at you know, family people or whatever at the hospital or travel nurses. So we get a good mix of people. That's why it's a little bit different. It's not just all vacation based. It has its efficiency to it, but we definitely came up with a theme. Every room and every, every unit has its own theme. And when you, you know, the pictures are different, different colors and, and it's a different name too. So on a marketing side of things, they're, they're different. You're, you're clearly picking like, Hey, I like this more because of your, you know, because of the colors and layout. So you're not just having the same three times on the market. Yeah. It doesn't seem to be the best strategy. Yeah. That's smart. So, so on a, so ha has that been running for a full year? No, this has been running for, <laughs> so we were, we were a pretty good condition to complete it right before the hurricane last year. Um, and then the roof wasn't quite done yet. And then we had two days, three days of hardcore rain. So we basically had to redo the whole inside. Uh, <laughs> this is probably why it cost a little bit more than we initially expected. So we had that, which would have not been the case, you know, anywhere else, but it happened. We didn't know. So it took us longer. And so we completed it in February of this year. So it's been running a couple months. We had the hot season, usually like March, May. April, that, that, that time frame is like a hot season in Florida. Now July is a little bit slower and then the summer gets a little hot and then September, October, November is usually slow. And then the winter time is like crazy. crazy yeah. So the hot season was definitely good. It was almost about hundred percent, all three units. I guess we priced it a little bit too conservatively. We could have gone a little bit higher, yeah. but we just tested out the market. We wanted to get reviews and definitely got good feedback from people on what they like, what they don't like, made some small adjustments to, to compensate what the market likes and definitely have gotten success with it. What cash flow, you know, just on an average while you've been operating kind of cash flow you've been getting. It is. So th these are renting for like 160 a night, 165, 190 in the seasons, so three of those they were usually booked in a full. So that is, you know, what is that? Let me do the math. Yes. Yeah, like 30 times. 160 as an example, so it's 4,003, so roughly 15 grand a month. And then obviously our expense is with mortgage insurance and everything, roughly around two grand. So that's, that's significant cash flow. But of course you're looking at it as like a break even, right? You're kind of paying and renovation. So maybe like yeah. eight more months and then we really going to consider us making profit right now. We're just paying off what we initially invested in it, but at some point it's going to be really, really that's cool when it switches. That's, that's insane though. You're getting 15 K of cash flow per or 15 K of revenue, your costs. It, so cleaning and everything all in is only two K. No, I can't be right. That, that's not no, so cleaning is covered by the tenants. Right? you always charge? Oh, the so, so the, so the 15 of your, it's just a rental rate. Oh, you're, rental oh, rate. you're yeah, so, oh, wow. 
Our cost is obviously utility, Wi-Fi, insurance, and mortgage. Yeah. That's and then we have the landscaping people that come in and cut the grass twice a month, twice a, week, a month. Yeah. But that is it. Yeah. That's really, I mean, you're ca so over 10 K at cash flow per month on that property. Yeah. And in, in a season, I would say off season, maybe eight grand, six to eight grand, you know, depending on your rates and, and demand. But a lot of the times, you know, off season, you're just kind of capturing some of the travel nurses and you're getting a lower rate, but they're like booked for three months in yeah. a row and you're kind of backing on that. Got it. Got it. Well, congrats. That, that's a really, that's very, very good. <laughs> Talked to a lot of people. So congrats on, on, on a very, very successful investment. Just transitioning over to what else you're doing. Tell us about, you know, the ground of construction that you're also doing. Yeah. So we always wanted to get in construction when we initially started. It was always like our goal, you know, for most people that are listening, that is probably one of those things that you have to graduate into. Our banks are looking for, for a resume and they're pretty tough on construction. It's easier buying any, you know, existing properties, getting a DRC, a DCR loan, anything like this, but construction, you know, now it's you making sure you are the operator. So definitely we had to work towards it, but we always loved it. Our market is just, I wouldn't say right now is the best time to do construction nationwide, but our market has been just exploding. We have roughly 8,000 people on average on a monthly basis relocate here. We rarely have any inventory available. Prices are still going up. You're still getting multiple offers despite interest rates. And it's just because of the demand. We had 80,000 jobs opening in February. And our inventory is really 1920, 1940. Typical Florida that is not as demanded for people because everyone who comes now is coming from out of state. Yeah. And so we have this, this gap between what is available and what people would like to buy. And construction is definitely demanded. So the city obviously came in, changed the zoning of 3,300 homes to be now 30 units an acre to really promote high density. And, and now you're buying a single family home that at fix and flip price points and just building seven units, five units on there that you sell for oh, a million wow. bucks each, right? So it's, it's a game changer. Okay. And so it made sense for us to adapt to that market. And so we obviously used our acquisition strategies to find these rehab needed homes in great locations with that new zoning and going in and putting townhomes on there. It's a three-story townhome with an accessible rooftop, three, three and a half layer with a two car garage. It's a pretty cool, unique property. It's on the upscale side. So, you know, great finishes. It's up to code in Florida. You gotta you know, put impact windows, block construction because it's in a hurricane environment. So it's a little bit more expensive to build. But that is what's also demanded. You know, people looking for that security when they buy a house that is going to last through a hurricane and it's not right. going to be gone. So, look, that's great. So, let me just unpack a little bit there. New zoning, I mean, a ton of demand. I think mean, everyone knows Florida is super hot. Tampa, especially St. Pete area, is super, super hot. This new zoning thing is obviously great. You, you know, you're in that market and it's kind of important. And I think for folks, like really understanding your particular market not being spread to thing, like just really having domain knowledge in one area could be really, really valuable, right? You have, now you understand the zoning, you have the resume, I guess two things. One, it, it, I definitely want to hit on the construction side and how to qualify for that. I think a lot of people have questions on that. I have questions on that, but just from the numbers perspective, like how much is a piece of land, you know, like a rehab needed house, like what are you paying for that? And then, you know, what are you projecting for, you know, demoing it and then, you know, kind of all the work to get it, you know, to the, to the million dollar three bedroom townhouse. Right. right. So like the one that we currently have as an example, that is in downtown St. Pete walking distance to central Avenue and all the restaurants. So it's like in a prime location, Perfect. you bought the house. So it was interesting, right? The, the owner is an 80 year old lady. She's gotten offers from wholesales at 180 and 200, which is fair. We came in, we actually offered her 400 grand for that property. So we doubled because I knew she needed the money to pay for medical bills. So we went all out, but it was still a smoking deal for us considering the, you know, the value of the property. We're going to put five town homes on there. So we're still under a hundred grand per door, which is unheard of in anywhere downtown. Yeah. So a total cost, you know, including land, closing costs, soft costs, construction, everything, even the carry cost with the bank, the interest, origination fees, everything is roughly... 52% loan to value. So it's roughly 500 grand a door and then they're selling for close to a million. So there's around $500,000 in, in profits per door. Now it doesn't all go to us. Obviously there's equity partners, loan sponsors and so on, but it's a pretty 
big puffer that if the market turns, we just lower the price point to sell them and still have enough money to have, where everyone gets paid and everyone is happy. Got it. Wow. F fantastic. So just, I mean, 52%, you know, kind of, you're basically doubling your initial investment. And so are you, is most of this funded by third parties or using investor money, loans? You know, yeah. You yeah. So we do have a pretty big, I would say private equity group. We have a passive community where we have a lot of passive investors that would like to invest in real estate. They have professions where they make money outside and we basically the bridge for them to get into real estate. So we educate him, we help him to get set up. And between me and some other influencers and operators, we have various projects, you know, storage units, Airbnbs, construction. So they can really pick on whatever is their goal and whatever returns they'd like to receive, mm -hmm. whatever their appetite is, their stuff within our community. So we do a lot of that, you know, fundraising, have local events, we bring in people. So 20% is usually private equity and then 80% comes from a construction loan with a bank. Got it. Got it. And then when you said, you know, it's tougher to like buying a house that's already made is fairly straightforward. You have a job, you go to, you know, you get a Fannie and Freddie loan, you know, you know, loan to value and your debt ratio and then you know, your income to debt ratio. It's pretty straightforward. Tell us about kind of the process of getting a construction loan. Yeah, construction loans are definitely harder, right? Like if you're getting a fix and flip with a hard money lender, most of them ask you, hey, show me five recent flips you've done. And there might be people that don't, but usually they're asking you for experience. Same thing with construction, right? Hard money lenders are usually not the ones that are lending. You want to have local banks because rates are totally different. Yep. And of course, they want to be secure. So they want to know, are you an operator? Have you done any kind of construction? And if you're trying to do five units, they probably want to see... 12 or 20 units that you've completed over the last couple of years. They're you know, like, okay, you know what you're doing. You cannot be the builder and the loan sponsor. It has to be separate. Whoever is the builder cannot sign up the loan. Yep. So usually if you want to get started in that, obviously you have to find somebody who is ahead of you who can go in and just signs off the experience. That is just with most, most, you know, like if you do a flip, you usually find somebody who's done it. You always got to have somebody to start with until you have your own resume. So that's number one, which... It is harder to find somebody who's done construction than it is to find somebody who's done a flip. Right. There's one part. And then obviously banks take that project down from A to Z and back and forth and you know multiple times because on a you know, we, we have bought multifamilies and it's pretty straightforward there. They're looking at cash flow, they're looking at the debt service coverage ratio. Worst case happens to you, well, they just take the property back and sell it. Uh, and the property is always covered, right? In a construction, if midway I just disappear, well, that's a huge problem for the bank because who's going to finish it? Yep. And they're not going to sell it at the price point they need to get <laughs> the money out. So there's a lot of pressure on them. And usually they're looking for, obviously, these numbers. They don't really lend more than 60, 65% of value. They're trying to be covered there. They want you to spend the first 20%. They're getting multiple appraisals done. They really break down all your numbers and all your construction bids. And they're really just making sure that the numbers work and you know what you're doing and they've looked at the market and they know this stuff is going to sell. So it takes a lot longer to work with them and to get it approved and have everything done and show the bank, okay, we are ready to go. How long did it take you to, you know, when you first kind of knocked on the door at the bank to actually be able to, you know, close the loan? I would say if you have everything lined up 30 days, if you're oh, okay. working with okay. the bank okay. along the way, so like one of the projects now, you're four months in. And that was just because like, usually you go in, you entitle the land and it's like shovel ready. And then you go to the bank and then they do the underwriting and then they give you the loan 30 days later. In this case, we went in because initially you wanted to use the bank to acquire the land, then go through entitlement and then close the game with a construction zone. So we've been two different loans. So we worked from the very first day we had it under contract with the bank and kind of worked through the process of entitlement with the bank. And every time, obviously they're asking for review, feedback, inspection. So it has been slow. So I would recommend you going in entitling the land, getting it approved from the city for whatever you're trying to do, have plans ready, yeah. and then send it to the bank and shop for the best loans that will make your life a lot easier um, <laughs> okay. than, than going with them from the beginning. Cause <laughs> That's fantastic. Like, I mean, like you're doing some really, really, really neat stuff and in a great market. So, you know, congrats on, you know, pivoting. Sounds like pretty rapidly from Oregon, 
you know, where obviously there's some, there were some major issues there during COVID and then to a great market and, you know, like starting, starting from wholesaling to crown of construction in three years, you know, it's very, very, very impressive. So, you know, so congratulations on all the success and, uh, for you. folks that want to continue to follow your journey. What's the best place to find you? I would say Instagram, obviously we're on all social medias, but it's like the, the primary force. So it's max underscore Volmer, V O L L M E R. We post probably every single day, twice, three times a day. And then it's also connected to the other platforms where you post similar content. So definitely follow us there on, you know, what's going on on day to day. We give you guys some insights there. And if there's any questions, I do handle my own social media. So if you guys text me, DM me, I'm usually the one who also responds. Perfect. And we'll, we'll have a link to Max's Instagram account in the show notes. And if you're interested in Tampa, St. Pete and construction, you should definitely reach out to, to Max because he, yeah. he definitely knows yeah, what's love going. To. The way that I like to close the show is my final question. What is, you know, like real estate, Airbnbs is a team sport and you're a track and field athlete. Like you're obviously very aware, you know, no one does it. You know, if you want to, if you want to run fast, you run alone, you want to run far, you run with a team. What is one of the nicest things? What's one of the kindest things that someone's done for you in this journey? Oh my gosh. There's so many things, you know, obviously the reason why we got where we are so quickly is because we realized from day one, our net worth is our, our network is our net worth. And before we even really focus on systems operations, we always focus on who can we get to know, where do we have to be to get to know somebody who can help us. And there's always somebody just not being shy of asking. There's always somebody who's 10 X ahead of you who all of a sudden would like to help you. Right. And we've found a lot of really great mentors that, you know, wherever you want it to be, and the value those guys have given to us for pretty much nothing in return, because we couldn't really add much value to them, was just so tremendously. I mean, we would not be where, where we are without the people around us. And, um, you know, when I asked them every time, what can I do to, to give back to you? you? You literally changed my life. And they always just tell me, well, it's your responsibility eventually later on to give somebody else and help somebody else. Like the cycle continues, right? And, and that was one of the things that really touched me is like, okay, we have an impact now and eventually we can give it along to somebody else or what a community or whoever was, you know, needing of that help and continue to cycle what we've learned from somebody giving it back to some other people. Right. I mean, you're not really reinventing the wheel. Real estate is pretty straightforward. I mean, everyone who says they all got it by themselves is a liar, right? You talk to people, there's always somebody who taught you it and therefore you know how to do it and you're not doing it wrong. You're not wasting time and wasting money. So don't be shy of getting value from people. And there's so many amazing people out there, just like yourself that can help with specific things and short-term mental. I'm sure you guys have massive value to add to people. And, and that is where any value I've gotten came from people in our industry. Now, I, I, you know, I think you said it really, really well, you know, asking for help and, you know, being kind when you receive the help right. and being able to pass that on to someone else that, that needs it. Right. And, you're right. Like real estate is, we're not, we're, we're not, we're not flying rockets to the moon kind of thing. Right. Like <laughs> it's, 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 it's scary up front because like, you know, it's a lot of money and time and, you know, it's kind of this black box, but you know, there is a community out there, people that are, are willing to help you without, you know, an, an expectation of immediate return. Right. So I think it really is just be a good person, ask for help, be respectful of people's time, like do it, do the work beforehand, prepare as much as possible. It really shows when people come prepared with real questions and they're not asking kind of very basic things that you can just Google. I think if you have that approach and, you know, have a giving mindset, right? Having an abundance mindset. I think that's, that's, that's a super critical. I've seen the people that be successful. They're in a very abundant mindset. Like I'm happy to share what I learned, right? Happy to be giving yeah, because you know right. that if you give, the universe will, will, will get back to you. So a great way to, to end the show. Max, thank you so much for spending time with us today and look thank forward you. to following success. Thank you. Likewise.